Okay. So good morning. I'll say that again. And welcome to the first quarterly meeting of the South Coast Food Policy Council. Uh, my colleague, Chris Silva, who's the Director of Marketing Communications, will be co-facilitating with me, allowing people into the room and posting anything on the chat as well and helping me out. So, so thank you, Chris, for joining us. And thank you all for joining us for our first quarterly meeting of the, the South Coast Food Policy Council. If you could go into the chat, I'm going to invite you now to go into the chat and share your name, your organization, and where you're from, that'd be great if whatever town your organization, or if you're just an individual and you're a resident from a particular town, just post the town where you're from. So before we begin, I want to share a mission statement for the Marion Institute. The Marion Institute engages individuals and communities in an integrative approach to whole body health. We do this through our programmatic work that focuses on promoting health equity, advocating for food justice, and building resilient communities. Now, having said that, I'm actually gonna start our screen share. All right, Chris, can you see that? Okay. All right, everybody yes. see that? Chris, you can see that? Yes, can see okay, that. Yep. Thank you. All right. So we're going to actually go ahead and begin. And people, as people come on, we're going to invite them to mute themselves and we'll have, we'll go over the agenda right now. So the first thing we're going to do in this first quarterly meeting is we're going to have a land acknowledgement. And then we are going to go over the South Coast Food Assessment presentation. If you might have already heard us present this, and if you haven't, um, this will be a time for you to do that. We'll have time for questions. We'll give you an update on the progress of the South Coast Food Policy Council. We'll have time for questions. And we'll do updates and announcements from all of you, from the members at large. So if you have events coming up or if you have announcements you want to make from your organization, we want you to have time for yourself to say what you want to say. And again, this recording is merely for the notes. We're not posting the recording, but we will post the notes back through an email and for on our website as well. Okay. That said, there is an enormous amount of information to convey, so it may feel a bit like a fire hose coming to you, but we urge you to download the report and we'll talk about that in a minute with other information on that link. So I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement first. So we cannot talk about food in a place without acknowledging the land from which it comes. This is a basic premise for food policy council and food work in the food system. We cannot explore the present or consider the future without understanding the past, which includes acknowledging the harmful historic legacies that persist within and around us. Southeastern Massachusetts encompasses the present day counties of Bristol and Norfolk and Plymouth in the now Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts peoples. Pre-English history, this place, its gift of fertile soil, waters, wildlife, and beauty had already sustained indigenous tribes for 12,000 years. We honor and respect the precious food sources discovered, harvested, and cultivated by Native peoples and remain grateful to them for their connectedness to this land and their food traditions. We make this acknowledgement with intention and accept the responsibility of all as we continue to learn. We will honor the resources which sustain us today through their protection. May food be just one of many connections we use in our work to repair relationships with indigenous peoples of all nations living here today. Now, today, as I said, we are going to present the food system assessment key takeaways. And I'm gonna ask Chris, if you can share that link in the chat box, you can, once you go to that link, you'll be on our face on our um, website. And you will see at the bottom of the page, there are links to the entire 140 page food system assessment. There will also be abbreviated research in a digest. 
there's infographics and a few other resources. So if you go to that link, you'll find everything there. But what we're gonna do right now is gonna highlight the key takeaways from every chapter. So part of this is understanding where we're coming from. So the Food Policy Council is our newest program to Marion Institute. We brought this program on board at the end of 2019 and the onset of the pandemic. And the mission of the South Coast Food Policy Council is to connect, convene, and advocate for local food producers, consumers, and community members who seek policy and systems that strengthen our regional food system and improve community health and eliminate food insecurity. So with that understanding, working in partnership with our partners here, the Coastal Food Shed and the Southeastern Massachusetts Agricultural Partnership, CMAP, we commissioned Holly Fowler from the Northbound Ventures Consulting to work with us to one, update the food system from 2014, the food system assessment for South Southeastern Massachusetts and to two, to conduct a food hub feasibility study for the region. Now we are community-based and membership-based. So although the South Coast Food Policy Council is a program of the Marion Institute, we are community-driven. We have over 300 members of which many of you are part of. And we have about 30 members right now on the community advisory board. And these are members going from Plymouth to Fall River and towns in between. Members made up of different sectors of the food system along with different towns and different, an enormous amount of diversity to rep truly represent the region. The Community Advisory Board here will use this particular assessment that I'm gonna share with you as a roadmap to identify priorities that we will be working on in the coming months and years. Now you can read the goals on the left side. Those are important things, um, but the 2014 food system assessment was compiled strictly of publicly available data. But in this particular assessment in 2021, we added a great deal more of primary research, including personal for person forums, stakeholder interviews and different surveys. So that's a really important attribute that we added. And the last, that fourth point, is important because you can see how it dovetails into the Massachusetts Local Food Action Plan. Um, and it, what we're doing here in the assessment and what we'll be doing in policy supports all that work at the statewide level. Before we begin, if you're not familiar with some of the terms, we just want to share with you what, when we say these terms, what does this mean and what is this, what, how do we work in that? So the food system, comprises how our food is processed, produced, packaged, distributed, acquired, consumed, disposed of, recovered of. And this structure includes all people, animals, organizations, and resources that worked in our interconnected network to feed everybody. And the Food Policy Council itself, the role is to make recommendations and the key objective is to evaluate the local food system, which we have in this assessment, to provide collaborative solutions to problems, which we have been doing and I'll talk about later, and increase in coordination of the food system resources and advocate for and to create the needed changes within the policy of the food system. So with that understanding, this is another slide that's really important and it conveys an enormous amount of information there. Our food system is comprised of all these different layers and while it's complex and multifaceted, food policy councils must consider these, all these interdependent relationships and use a systems thinking approach when addressing change for the food system. In order to create that food system for everyone that works, we need to address the policy and decision-making you can see on the outside level. We need to understand how the culture and values impact all our policy decisions that reflect, it should reflect what we care about most in the culture and the values and the policy. I'd like to point out that the benefit of having a region with a local food policy council is that the food policy council work in the outer layers are focused on the long-term systemic changes that need to be addressed in order to elevate the inner circles um, of the blue of the production, processing, distribution, access, consumption, and recovery. So while we do that macro work, we do that so you guys can keep doing the inner work and it all flows together. 
And before I go any further, I just want to say if you have any questions, uh, please, we invite you to enter that into the chat box. And Chris will just may interrupt me and uh, direct me towards a particular question. So thanks. So this particular demographic within the food system assessment, I just want to highlight something very special within this slide. Bristol County, specifically Fall River and New Bedford, are our region's highest need center with medium incomes half that of Massachusetts. So this begs the question of just how different specific towns are with respect to the rest of the state. And we wanna focus some of the efforts more looking at what are the highest needs and we wanna address those in the Food Policy Council. That's, that'd be something that the key, one of the key takeaways is. In the first chapter with food production and harvest, one of the big takeaways, farming remains hard. It's always been hard and it's still difficult today. Based on the USDA agricultural census from 2012 to 2017, the number of farms decreased by 8.1% and the amount of land in farms decreased by 8% and outpacing the state in both instances. And urban agriculture remains nascent in this area with we have a number of densely populated centers that are ideal for green space and productive space. I'm gonna drill down to some key numbers. The average age of farmers in the center, you can see continues to rise and is now the average is 59.8 years old. And the replacement rate for young farmers is but a fraction. The aging farmer population shows the need for more technical assistance and succession planning support. Otherwise, prime farmlands become vulnerable to development. The other piece I wanna highlight is 40% of farmers are women and 98% are white, which means we have a lot of work to do in making farming and fishing racially diverse occupations. Access to land remains a barrier. Any loss of land is too much. This is especially true when we continue to become more reliant on our food local food systems and become, that have become impacted by climate change, natural disasters and droughts brought on by other parts of the country. And we'll talk more about that later. One of the key things from this particular slide, cranberries and oysters are the power crop, but in this particular instance, I'm gonna highlight cranberries. They are the power crop in this particular region, specifically Plymouth County, but there are real threats to this important crop. Market demands, for key products like cranberry juice, competition from others producing states that have cranberries, and climate change really points to a need to diversify the produce in our particular region. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Again, I said earlier that land access is a barrier. It certainly is, it's expensive. We need to be able to produce more food locally. And due to climate change, New England Feeding New England Group is currently researching how New England can produce more food for New England because we're anticipating because of climate change, people from the West with the fires and the droughts, people in the Southeast with all the storms and the flooding, they're gonna migrate up to New England. So this is what we're anticipating over the next 10 or so years. And you may have already seen that. We have heard that by stories, the people of moving up in this area, but the research is ongoing right now and what that looks like and what we need to do to prepare for that. So the research also from the study indicates the same thing. Increase in local production through right to farm and other urban agri ordinances needs to occur. Plymouth County's done a fantastic job and we need to look more at Norfolk and Bristol counties and how do we increase the right to farm ordinances, which would allow many tarm towns to raise chicken, sheep, and other things in their yards and towns. So that's one of the things the study shows. Now, this is a particular interest to our area. The counties of Bristol, Plymouth, and Norfolk are home to a combined 18 coastal towns, all with active commercial fisheries. The port of New Bedford remains the most valuable and most active commercial fishing port in the country. The New Bedford Fairhaven Harbor Economic Impact Study released in 2019 shows sustained growth since 2015, which is good news. Economic value estimated 11.1 billion 
The business revenue at 3.8 billion, direct jobs at 6,808, and direct wages 362 million. An estimated 78% of seafood passing through New Bedford is exported. And restaurant operators interviewed for this report stated, it is often easier and cheaper to buy Icelandic than local seafood. This is kind of a problem then. We have to figure out how to make food more accessible to the region, how to educate the market in this area to use more seafood since it's here locally. And that will help our economy as well as if we do all that. In the next chapter, food distribution and processing, some of the key takeaways are not so bad actually. Food processing and distribution are critical steps in the food value change for making sure that food produced or harvested reaches consumers in a functional and efficient way. We have added capacity since 2014. In 2018, Meatworks opened an 11,000 square foot USDA inspected multi-species slaughterhouse and meat processing facility for cattle, hogs, sheep, goats in Westport, Massachusetts, great news. We maintained capacity with Dartmouth Grange Kitchen in Dartmouth and Hope in Maine in Warren, Rhode Island, which continue to serve as the primary commercial kitchen and food incubators in the region, also good news. In 2017, Coastal Food Shed spun off of Mass in Motion New Bedford, focused on filling gaps in food access and distribution on the South Coast. So food, the Coastal Food Shed, in case you're not aware, sources locally grown and manufactured products from farmers and food makers, and then sells it through, through three main areas that you can see on this slide. Through the mobile farm stand, through the New Bedford Farmers Market, and through a virtual market. So this is a huge help to our local farmers that they could go to Coastal Food Shed, and then if they don't have capacity to go to farmers markets or the farmers markets are not open during the winter, they can find a different venue to sell their produce. This is all great. But a survey of 43 local producers suggested Coastal Food Shed could continue to expand its food hub services, offering additional aggregation and transportation options to farmers with the potential to channel more locally grown produce product to wholesale buyers like restaurants and institutions. So not too bad news there from the results of that information. From the next chapter of food access and consumption, a survey conducted of the three counties in southeastern Massachusetts, around 490 residents in 2020 returned the following information. Consumers access food in a variety of ways, and we know that. 80% rely primarily on grocery stores and big box stores for their food at, at home, which is not too much of a surprise. Food access and security is multidimensional. So when we look at that, we have to look at several things. Physical access. So let's look at that. 19% of census tracts in southeastern Massachusetts are rated as low, in or low income or low access, where a significant number of residents live more than one mile in the urban area or 20 miles in the rural area from the nearest supermarket. So there is some issues around food access. And where more than 100 housing units do not have access to a vehicle and more than one half mile from the nearest supermarket. Again, some things to consider. And a lot of different food providers in this region have filled the gap during COVID, which is not necessarily reflected in this report. So there has been some pop-up food, uh, food markets uh, from different, our different partners, and they're doing a fantastic job with that. The other piece of access is around economic access. 39% of the people surveyed said often or sometimes worry that food will run out before there's more money to buy more food. And 30% often or sometimes ran out of food before there was more money to buy more. The other issue is around cultural access. We need to do a better job of aligning our food items and what we grow with what is culturally um, needed in our particular area. Is that something to think about? The other piece to consider when we talk about food access is stigma. So one of the things the survey showed was that 23% of households in the survey sample relied on food pantries in the last 12 months. But that's also showing the same survey showed that 
that's hardest to get is meat, seafood, fresh foods, and vegetables. So some of those things we have to start looking into as well. Now, doing a deeper dive into food access, let's look at the SNAP gap. Prior to COVID, Bristol County continues to have the highest food rate insecurity of the three counties in the study. One in eight kids in Bristol County were food insecure, which is a reflection of what we saw in the earlier demographic slide. And regionally, one in 13 kids are food insecure. But during COVID, as many of you saw, businesses closed, unemployment spiked, and food insecurity rose to 17.5% across Massachusetts. The largest percent increase, 59% of food insecurity individuals in the nation, according to Feeding America. In our particular region, food participation in SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, has increased across the three counties of southeastern Massachusetts since 2014, but the SNAP gap shows that 45% of people that are eligible for SNAP are not using SNAP. So question mark there. And HIP, the Healthy Incentive Program participation is even lower. So we still have to figure out how do we educate the public on what's there? How do we, what are the practical problems, whether it's translation, act, easy access to get online. And again, many of our food partners are food providers in the social service industry are doing a fantastic job of helping people access SNAP and HIP. And we need to see more of that. One of the other pieces that the showed in the study is that black and Latino communities have been disproportionately impacted by food insecurity during that pandemic. Now, we talked about access. One of the things that I wanna highlight here is that the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and the Leduc Center for Civic Engagement started figuring out years ago, how do we help people find food, all kinds of food, uh, whether it's a farm stand, a farmer's market, a food soup kitchen, specialty stores, and so on. They started working on putting together an app. And Chris, if you could share that particular app on the chat, That'd be great. And we are, the Marion Institute has now housed this particular app. You can use your phone or a laptop and get on to foodfinder.marioninstitute.org. And if you look there, you can see the different stores. And we invite people to use this app and let us know if it works for you, what problems you may have, so we can start addressing this. We want to make this usable and user friendly to both people who need food, but also for the, just the general public. So we wanna offer that as well. And in our next chapter for food loss, recovery, waste and reduction and recycling, there is a preferred hierarchy to reducing and managing organic waste, which when kept out of landfills benefits local people and the environment and the economy. We elevating compost creation over energy production returns valuable nutrients to the soil for growing more food. So you can see that little triangle on the right side, that's the hierarchy of how we prefer uh, food loss to work. The state organic waste policy has been a great policy success story that went into effect in 2014 and helped defer an estimated 1.5 million tons of food. And the food rescue and donated has increased since 30 by 30% 30 since 2014, which is great news. But the even better news is that in November 2022 this year, the waste ban will expand to businesses and institutions that produce a half ton or more of food material per week. So the, again, we're doing a great job with that, but we can do a better job with this. Drilling down into some of those particular pieces, there are 12 operations in Southeastern Massachusetts that accept diverted food material, which is great, but we need more of those. And gleaning is nascent in our region with only a third of US, a third of produce grown in the US remaining in the fields. So if we had more gleaning, an operation for gleaning in our region, that would be enormously helpful. Uh, and that's just something this study shows as well. Consumer education on food labeling would be another issue that will be helpful to uh, lessen food waste. So these are all good things. We have good news on this, but we can also do better. For the local food economy, this gets kind of interesting. 
The local food economy is driven by numerous direct and indirect inputs across the food value chain. In southeastern Massachusetts alone, there are over 11,000 food and beverage stores, food services and drinking places, food manufacturing, businesses, agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting entities. These sectors contribute a combined $5.7 billion in direct wages to the state's overall $15.7 billion in direct wages. That's important to know. And the food manufacturing, there are 388 of them, are not scaled to retail markets. They're scaled for massive wholesale international distribution. So what's their role in supporting a regional food economy? That's a good question. And the food services and drinking places sector contributes the most to the region's food economy in terms of number of businesses, total wages, average employment, yet its average salaries are consistently below other sectors. So we have to figure out how do we increase the wages for people while keeping food affordable? That's a, a question that we have to balance out and when it comes to policy issues. Another key piece is the region's agricultural contribution to the economy relies on wheat, what I said earlier, cranberries and oysters. Cranberry production is credited with 7,000 jobs and generates more than $1 billion in the state's economy. And the shellfish aquaculture industry in Massachusetts are responsible for over 900 jobs and generates approximately 45.5 million in Massachusetts economy. 30 million of that is from oysters. And Duxbury in our region is the largest agricultural producer of oysters in the state. So that's an important thing for our area. Diversification and how both these crops land in the market would be a mitigating strategy in this concentration of economic value that's susceptible to climate or external shocks. So those are some of the key takeaways from our their local economy from this chapter. Drilling down a little bit, you can see some of the numbers. I just wanna point out a few of them. Wages have decreased by 3%. That's a big deal since 2007, 2014. And during the 2012 agricultural census, Southeastern Massachusetts represents 21% of all hired farm labor in Massachusetts, counting for nearly 25% of all farm wages statewide. So some of these numbers are kind of revealing and the direction that we have to look towards to try to figure out where are some opportunities for making a better policies and in doing a better job in our food production. The last chapter, that I'm gonna go over is really about the food policy. All these indicators that key takeaways that I've been talking about have been directing us to this particular area. You can see on the right side of the page, there are uh, in more bigger words, access to land. I'm not gonna read through every single thing. You can look at that yourself, but what I do wanna highlight is when we consider these particular policy actions, we have to remember a few of these particular things. We have to ensure that both the land and the skilled labor to grow food in southeastern Massachusetts across the state and across New England for regional resiliency. We have to ensure all residents have equal access, and I talked about physical, economic, and cultural inclusive to healthy, from uh, nutrient dense foods. We have to ensure that economic development goals are aligned and actions are coordinated so no one is left behind. And we have to ensure that we're doing everything possible to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change and on our health and the environment overall. So those are the key things that we're gonna be looking at both as the Food Policy Council. We'll be using this particular document as a way to have our guideposts for making decisions on our policy actions moving forward. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for now. If there are any questions, um, this is a good time for right now. Do you have any questions? And if not, don't worry about it. You can also email us later. You can also you can um, email Liz Wiley, our executive director of the Marion Institute, or myself, Christine Smith. You can uh, Chris, can you put our information into the chat box? That'd be great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Now this part, I'm not. I'm just stop screen sharing from right now. From now forward, we're just going to use more of the video format. So right now it's 9:30, which is great. 
So from now to the end, what we're going to do, if you have no more questions, I'm just going to give an update on where we are with the South Coast Food Policy Council, and then I'm going to open it up to any more questions. And then I'm going to open it up to the floor to all of you if you want to share what's happening with your organization, anything happened that's food related or policy related, we want to know. And again, this recording is simply for notes. So um, thank you. So for that, I'm just going to start begin with our update. So as I said before, the South Coast Food Policy Council's mission is to connect, convene, advocate for local food producers, consumers, and community leaders who seek policy and systems that strengthen our regional food system, improve community health, and eliminate food insecurity. And you heard me describe the role of the Food Policy Council in this presentation, which is to evaluate local food systems, which we have in this food system assessment, and then our role is to increase the coordination of food system resources, which we do through our coastal, our South Coast Food Alert Listserv. So that particular listserv is about 100 people. And anytime we have any grant information, any webinars or any questions, or we have extra resources we wanna share with, with a community, we use that listserv to talk with each other. Um, so that is one way we've been helping to coordinate that. And if you want to join that, please email me and I will get you hooked up into that South Coast Food Alert Listserv. We had been through, from the beginning of the pandemic, the South Coast Food Policy Council through Liz Wiley had been coordinating uh, by initially weekly meetings and then bi-weekly meetings on emergency food resources for this particular region through Zoom meetings. And we stopped this month because we're now moving towards the more quarterly report style. And because we've had developed relationships over the past two years through those weekly and then bi-weekly meetings, uh, we are now encouraging people to use the LiftServe to speak with each other through those immediate resource needs. So we have been coordinating resources and trying to connect people and helping to do that over the last few years. The other role that we have is to provide collaborative solutions, which we, again, we've been doing, but now we're taking on the new role of advocacy within coordinating all that as well. So we wanna work with all of our partners in doing advocacy and policy work with the South Coast Food Policy Council. But I wanted to let you know what we have done up to date from the advocacy side, working with the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative, the Massachusetts Urban Agriculture Commission, Mass Food for Mass Kids, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, and many other organizations. This is the actions we have taken between May and December of 2021. Since COVID, we, there has been acceptance of written testimony before a hearing, so we have done the following with written testimony. Several letters of testimony have gone to support ensuring the Massachusetts state budget funded UMass Extension, Mass in Motion, Healthy Incentive Program, and the Food Security Infrastructure Grant Program. And we have done several letters of testimony with the Food and Food Security Infrastructure Grant Program um, as we have several actions within that as well. We have provided testimony in support of an act promoting equity in agriculture. We have provided testimony in support of an act securing federal ARPA funds. The ARPA funds is the American Rescue Plan Act to go into the food system itself in a wide variety of areas. We have testified in support of an act to secure federal monies towards the Farm to School grant program and another letter of testimony to make this a permanent part of the Massachusetts state budget. We have provided testimony in a variety of acts related to pesticides, ensuring we safeguard children in playgrounds and people outside who work outside uh, are not impacted by the harmful chemicals and pesticides. So those are some of the testimonies we have given between May and December. But in order to engage the community as a whole, the South Coast Food Policy Council, we have established the Community Advisory Board, and many of you are on this call today, and thank you for being here. I spoke, we spoke briefly about the Community Advisory Board in this presentation, and the people are representing, like I said, from different food parts of the food sector to different towns and different areas to make a diverse and racially diverse 
group representing within the Food Policy Council itself. And they will work with us to establish the priorities based on the food system assessment for the years to come. So far, the Community Advisory Board has received this food assessment presentation, this food system assessment presentation, and they have received training on the food, on food equity from the YWCA. We will have our first strategic planning meeting with the Community Advisory Board in the late, December, late January, uh, this January 27, with all of our Community Advisory Board members. And again, we'll be using this assessment to guide our actions for those policy priorities. Once we've identified those priorities, we will establish working groups on those priorities. And this is where we'll need all of your help to take action. We will publish and we'll tell you what those particular working committees are, what the priorities have been. And we're gonna invite you all to come on to these working groups wherever you feel called to join uh, to implement these priorities. We do know we'll have a public policy working group. We know that. So that said, once that particular group is operational, we'll start doing legislative alerts. We'll start building out legislative campaigns. We'll invite you to write to your legislators, joint committee members and governor and so on to support specific food policy related issues. So that will be on our agenda this year. Those cam campaigns will start rolling out and we will need all your support to be both on the working committees and to actually take action. We will also, for more training, we're gonna invite the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative to do a training for our South Coast Food Policy Council Community Advisory Board and training for the members at large. So we're gonna invite that. So we'll have some expertise coming our way in training to help us all build our confidence and know what we're doing as we work on these policies. Are there any questions so far? I want to open it up to you. So if you have a question, you can either raise your hand, put it in the chat, or just unmute yourself and talk. Thank okay. so much for a great presentation. Hey, Joy. I appreciate it. And, and hi, everyone. I'm relatively New, but I also serve um, very gratefully on the, the CAB that was recently established. So I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. And also, um, so is the New Bedford Health Department. Um, I was just so curious. So I've been reading and rereading the food assessment. And I think what's one of the points of interest for me is the, um, the keeping things local. And so I'm just so curious why it's so um, why it's cost prohibitive and why we're kind of having to, it's easier to get fish from Iceland over you know, here. So I'd like to look at more of like a, the root cause of that, more of the upstream issue that's causing that. So that seems really interesting to me because if you, it just seems completely not sustainable just in general for us, everything's going the opposite direction, which, it's not necessarily a new thing, but it's glaring where we're like, okay, we well, are a huge fishing port, um, probably the best in the country and uh, it's all going out and then we're getting stuff from Iceland. So I don't know if anyone else is, um, you know, it seems fairly incongruent and um, it might just be interesting to look at that one component because it is such a large um, revenue source for us uh, in our economy. And I'm just curious how we might could potentially mitigate that. I know that might have was might have already been brought up prior, but to me that seems very glaring. Thank you, Joya. I I don't particularly have an answer for that. Um, that's a great question. I think Liz Wiley's going to jump on after she's done with another meeting. She might know. Is I'm going to open it up to the floor because I'm not. Uh, I know there's a lot of experts in this room, so if there's anybody else. Uh, who wants to jump in on that question, I invite you. That's more of a deeper dive too, right? But just something to start percolating because it just, it's so sad to see it all go out and then we're getting fish from, you know, other places beyond Iceland too, but just opposite directions. I, I know that's just economies of scale, but 
I think that's just a larger question that would be would be nice if we could try and reconcile some of that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And that has that question. Yeah, so I wrote that question down so we could do a deeper dive. And for those of you, I don't have the answer, but I would I will do is I'll find the answer and I'm gonna put that in the notes when I send it back out. So that's a great question, Joya. Thank you. I might be Okay, thank I'm you, sorry. This is Michael Patella from the Mass Department of Ag. Obviously, uh, my colleagues in in uh, at Marine Fisheries uh, will be able to answer answer that question exactly. I can I can tell you generally, New Bedford's a large port, but the majority of the landing is the scallop is scallops. There is a very limited ground fish coming into New Bedford ports. Whether that's cod or pollock, a few years back, it was it was very very low. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue for that catch. A lot of that has to do with with you know stocks that are available and the size of the fish. So I think there's been a move with the the buy local movement and and some folks uh, in the culinary world to try and use underutilized species and whether that's um, you know skate. Uh, or dogfish. These these are you know what we consider Americans in the Northeast as trash fish, but they are used uh, in other countries, um, and that's that's been going on for twenty years. It's it's not an easy thing to do to do. There's been a lot of initiatives to try to get these underutilized species that that we can catch in abundance um, on on menus and on people's plates, and and it just hasn't been uh an easy thing to do so once again the new bedford port is mainly scallops um so that's why you're seeing a lot of a lot of fish coming in from from other other countries um there's also the component of where where sort of boats are registered where they're fishing and then where that fish goes to be processed so it, it's a convoluted complex problem that a lot of bright people have been trying to solve for decades <laughs> um, but I might be able to help with with exact numbers. I can I could probably get that from the Department of Marine Fisheries. Oh, that'd be wonderful, Michael. If you could do that, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Thank you. I can, I can have a little bit from, uh, oh, from uh, Rob Sheen from uh, New Bedford Public Schools, the food service director. So we are um, finishing up our, our procurement uh, with a few companies. Uh, North uh, Coast Seafood, I think, is New Bedford and Red's Best also um, catches uh, locally. So we we're trying to get and use a lot of those products that, uh, that you were talking about, you know, some of the, um, the ones that are um, not used uh, like the big uh, haddocks and, and so forth, but uh, we can use them in the schools. We're gonna add them to our menu. So we'll start mm -hmm. hacking away at a little bit of that. So, but that's probably not gonna happen until I think um, February, we'll, we'll start adding it to our menus. And then hopefully, you know, you would think uh, New Bedford would be big uh, seafood eaters, but, um, it's the way that it's made and it's not, you know, for, for kids, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a method to the madness of introducing it. A lot of districts have a lot of great success with it and they use hundreds of pounds, you know, a month. So we're hoping, um, you know, a district this size that we can definitely get it back on the menu and keep it there, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future now that we have um, uh, procurement and purchasing uh, agreements made up with, with those two companies at least. So we're trying. Good, good to see you, Rob. And yeah, thanks for for adding that. Yeah, Red's Best does does great work with local local catch. You know, once again, it, it's great having one school district um, put this in place. It, it'd be interesting to see if the volume was there if you had you know school districts across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the quota systems. Like I said, it's a very convoluted issue in fisheries. Yeah, and I think what we're trying to do too is, um, you know, in this district, we 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 have issues with space. You know, a lot of people have that, you know, freezer space, storage space, where we, I've been on this three-year project to um, get a culinary center, you know, warehouse. And so, um, you know, if that could help some of the local school districts like Dartmouth or, um, you know, uh, Marion, uh, Wareham and those folks, um, then maybe I could be the, the central point that could store some and then and help distribute to some schools too. So that's kind of in the back of my brain. Um, a very small part of what my brain or whatever, but um, that would be ideal because that would help because a lot of districts don't have storage space, you know, and it's hard to, for, for delivery systems to, to work for small deliveries. You know, we have that problem with milk and produce right now um, in, uh, in a lot of the districts uh, neighboring New Bedford. So 
definitely something we're working on. Hopefully, in the next year, this uh, if this thing um, uh, gets put together and we can I can get into a new building that has more storage, uh, that would help. Thank you, thank you both, Rob and Michael. This is great. Are there any other questions following up from Joya's question? Anything about the food system assessment or anything about um, where we are in the Food Policy Council? If not, then I'll open it up to all of you. If you want to share anything that's going on in your organization or any food related issues, events, announcements, you're welcome. Just unmute yourself, put it in the chat, or um, raise your hand. Hi, good morning. This is Kevin from Reptile Strauss's office. How are you? Hi, good morning. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for hosting this. Um, it is very informative, very uh, collaborative. Um, our office has a, uh, a good relationship with Coastal Food Shed, which we've worked with since around 2015. And we're just uh, happy to be of service. Um, we look forward to hearing from you and uh, us here in the legislature. And if we can be of any service, please feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate that. And thank you for representing Strauss's office, you and being here. It's wonderful. Yeah, we're excited to work with you on the advocacy pieces. Yeah. We look forward to it. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. So if there's nothing further, I want to share with you the next few meetings. We'll have a quarterly meeting, April 14, then July 7, then October 13. So uh, April 14, 9 to 10. July 7, 9 to 10. And October 13, 9 to 10. And if there's nothing else, um, I just want to let you know, so we'll be posting the notes to this meeting and we'll send that out in an email blast but we'll also put it on our website um, and thank you so much for coming to our first quarterly meeting we'll push it out further um, as we go on and we'll have a, a more full agenda as we go forward to our next meeting in april and we'll let you know what the agenda is ahead of time in the meantime thank you again for being here and um, have a great day and yeah, take Thank care. Be safe. Be safe Bye in the COVID. Everyone. Happy Bye. New Year. Thanks. Steve, could you just repeat the dates? Sure. It's April 14, July 7, and October 13. All right. Thank you. I inverted a couple dates. So I wanted okay. to double check. That's, right. That's okay. Thanks. And I'll send that out with the notes, and um, it'll be on the website too. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay. okay. I'm going to stop the recording. She wouldn't stop.